This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. In Chapter 7, we begin to go through the stages of the audit. And the diagram here, um, we'll, we'll mainly go through actually Chapter 8, because what we want to concentrate on, on this chapter, really, is uh, whether or not, and what, what will happen uh, really before you begin the audit, uh, is you have to decide whether or not you actually want to accept the audit. So picture yourself, a, uh, <clears throat> a company comes along, a finance director of the company, or perhaps a member of the audit committee comes along, approaches your company, <clears throat> and says, we would like to put you forward at the AGM, because remember the members have to vote on it, We'd like to put your name forward at the AGM uh, to be our new auditors. And of course, it is immensely flattering. Uh, your lies, your eyes will light up with kind of money signs because there's lots more fees and so on coming in here. It's uh, it's something that you would like to take on. It uh, signifies growth and uh, so on. Uh, but auditors have to think uh, carefully whether or not uh, they should accept work which is offered to them. Uh, you, you just need to think, perhaps, a moment or two, why uh, you you need to consider that. Uh, and it, it, in many ways, comes down to questions of ethics and threats. Uh, for example, if uh, we're talking about threats to the fundamental ethical principles, one of the threats was familiarity, that, that you are very friendly with or even related to uh, perhaps the finance director in the client. So what happens if the company which has approached you, uh, the finance director is your brother or is your sister or is a close friend? Uh, ethically, you, you couldn't really take that audit on. Or what would happen if this is a very large audit and the amount of fees that were coming from it was going to be maybe 25% of your total fee income, uh, then this would create a self-interest threat because once you're in and doing the audit, uh, you could not really bear to lose a client who was paying you 25% of your audit fees uh, because this could put you into kind of severe financial difficulties. So before we say yes, uh, we have to think carefully about it. We have to go through what's called acceptance procedures. And what I've been talking really here is uh, to consider, are we uh, uh, professionally qualified to act legally? Uh, are we part of a, uh, an appropriate body? What are the ethics, the self-interest threats, uh, even professional competence and due care will come into that if the audit is in an insurance company and we have no experience whatsoever of the uh, particular problems and risks in insurance companies, then could we carry out that uh, audit to the proper standard of professional competence and due care? Uh, will, will we be able to act objectively? Are we independent sufficiently of this uh, audit? So we have to go through all the ethics, all the ethical threats uh, to see uh, whether or not uh, we actually want to take it on. We have to make sure that we have adequate resources of uh, staff and time, and I suppose expertise, this is emphasising the, the professional competence and due care. Uh, the trouble with many audits is that the year end is the 31st of December, and so you're just kind of overworked really January, February, March. And could we fit in another audit? And if we did, would this be hurting our service to existing clients and maybe in the long term hurting our reputation. We would be of course very interested in the fee, uh, a fee which is uh, enough to cover the work that has to be done to gather sufficient appropriate ordered evidence. Um, Trim it down if you want to, but be careful of low-balling that we put in a ridiculously low fee to win the audit, perhaps in the hope of getting other lucrative work later on. Here's one that may um, surprise you. Investigate directors. When you take on a new audit, 
You will be getting fees, but you are exposing yourself to risk. The risk that you give the wrong ordered opinion. The risk may be that there is fraud occurring within that company, which has been well uh, concealed from you and which you don't uh, see. And it is normal for uh, potential auditors to investigate the directors. And if it's not a listed company, if it's a private company, the main owners of that company, where did they get their money from? Have they a history of setting up companies, putting them into liquidation, kind of setting them up again, putting them into liquidation and so on? Do you, do you really want to be associated with that? I can remember, oh, maybe six years ago, uh, teaching auditing in, in a, a particular country abroad. And again, I won't, won't mention which one it is. And uh, it was to teaching auditing to one of the big four firms of accountants. And one of the people there said, yes, our company will never take on any audit work to do with casinos. Because at that time in that country, the chances were that the casino business was effectively dominated by the local mafia. And it was being used for money laundering and, and, and all sorts of potentially illegal activities. And of course, these are exactly the sorts of uh, managers and shareholders who might be willing to bring to bear a bit of physical intimidation. And they thought it was just safer, better for all concerned to steer well away from that sector of the market. But uh, you can look at databases, uh, you can look at court records, uh, you can look at uh, usually the, the kind of company's house where companies are registered, you can look for directors who've been banned for a period maybe because of bad behaviour in the past. You can look at uh, county court judgments to see whether or not maybe the director has been sued for, you know, not paying debts or, or something of that effect. And you're going to be looking at audit risk. Audit risk both because maybe the directors and the managers, but also the sort of business it's in. Again, I would go back maybe to the casino business. Even if you didn't suspect the owners of being less than trustworthy, the casino business is a cash business and uh, it can be uh, uh, quite tricky to establish proper controls on a cash business uh, unless, the, unless the business itself is very security conscious, you know, with closed circuit televisions in the ceiling looking at the money passing uh, uh, through it. And just the risk might be too high. The risk that you're going to get the audit wrong. Uh, and, you know, we are weighing up fee versus risk. You know, we're, we're not auditors for charitable purposes. We are auditors to make a profit. And, and part of making a profit is not experiencing too much risk for the fee you're going to be getting. Is the accounting uh, reporting framework acceptable? So, so basically, if the company is, is accounting according to the IFRSs and the IASs and so on, it probably will be acceptable. Uh, but you might be worried if uh, uh, what they're doing is reporting only on a cash basis rather than an accruals basis. You have to be aware of money laundering uh, regulations. Uh, money laundering regulations can get auditors into trouble. Certainly in the UK, auditors are required to report suspicions of money laundering to the authorities. They don't even have to have proof, just a suspicion of money laundering. And if they don't report that, it's up to five years in prison. Furthermore, when they report it, they mustn't tell the client they've reported that there mustn't be any what's called tipping off. Otherwise, of course, the, the client would begin to, to kind of conceal uh, matters. They would have been warned. Expertise and competence, I think I've touched on in the example of the insurance company. What about the credit rating of the client? Uh, it's all very well arranging a fee, but if the client looks as though it's, uh, you know, very high current liabilities, very low uh, current assets, how is it going to pay the fee? We don't want bad debt. So wouldn't we be just a bit stupid if, as auditors, we didn't foresee a bad debt problem in a client uh, when we would have lots of information potentially available to us. And we also have to communicate with the present auditors. Why are they not 
going to be the current auditors anymore. And there's two reasons which we have mentioned in, in, in the past. One is that present auditors have resigned. Secondly, the present auditors have been sacked. Both situations might be innocent. You might resign because the client has outgrown you. Uh, you might be essentially sacked because the company wants or has a deliberate policy of changing its auditors every 10 years, perhaps, because I think that cuts down the familiarity risk and is allowing fresh pairs of eyes to come in and to do the audit. But always at the back of your mind, you're worried. Uh, the present auditors are resigning because they perhaps have lost trust in the directors. They think there's a fraud going on that the directors are concealing. Or perhaps they have been sacked by the company because the auditors are too good. They keep picking away. They keep wanting to see a contract and so on. Uh, they keep insisting that accounting standards are adhered to uh, when really the client would rather manipulate profits in a, in a, a much easier way. Here is the uh, way in which you are supposed to communicate with the existing auditors. Uh, or the outgoing auditors. It's a, it's a bit of a kind of dance of kind of good manners and etiquette uh, here. So uh, if you're approached by a client and this is the, uh, the first audit, then you obviously can't communicate with previous auditors. You have to make your own mind up about the integrity of the directors. If it's not the first auditor audit, then there will be previous auditors. And first of all, you have to ask permission uh, from the client to contact the outgoing auditor. And if the client refuses, essentially that's the end of the matter. You're not going to go any further because the presumption is that the client is refusing because they're covering up some, some, some difficulty. You are given uh, permission uh, to write to the outgoing auditor, but then of course confidentiality rules mean that the outgoing auditor can't just write back to you and say, yes, they're fine, or no, I think there's been a problem in, in the past. They're bound by confidentiality. And they have to get permission from their, in a way, old client to write back to you. And again, if uh, the potential client doesn't give permission to the old auditors to write, that's an end of it. The potential client is trying to, you know, put a clamp on the communication uh, to stop the communication working and you presume the worst. What you hope for uh, is uh, that uh, the relevant information will be provided. You hope that the old auditor will write back and say there is no particular reason why we're resigning. Uh, we have no particular suspicions. We've had no particular difficulty maybe with the client and that's pretty much a green light for you to go. If they don't write back, or perhaps you think they're writing back using slightly cagey uh, words and so on, uh, then you might get a little bit worried uh, and you have to work a, a bit harder to try to find that missing information in other ways. So we've gone through the, the process now. We, we've, we've looked at uh, whether or not we take what to take on the client. Uh, we've got kind of uh, no worrying signs from the external, uh, from the outgoing auditor. The next thing we do is to send out an engagement letter. And the way to think about an engagement letter is it essentially is a contract between the auditor and the client. What the auditor will do uh, and what the auditor expects the client to do. To do. And if this isn't set out in, in, a, in a kind of contract at the start, then the chances are that further down the road, when you're in the middle of the audit, uh, the client says, oh, I didn't know I had to do that, or I didn't know I had to show you the board minutes, and so on. And if you haven't agreed all of this in the engagement letter, then you are in a relatively weak position. So what the engagement letter will do, it will define the auditors and the management's responsibility. It will say that management is responsible for preparing the financial statements. Management is responsible for implementing a good system of internal control. Management is responsible for preventing and detecting fraud. Our responsibility of, as auditors is to audit the financial statements. The letter provides uh, written evidence of our 
acceptance, so people know now they have an auditor, and it'll be sent to the, the board of directors, or the audit committee, and or the audit committee, prior to the first audit, so that before we kind of go in through the door, the contract is in place. There may, in some cases, be additional reports required, in addition to the audit report, and if so, some, some, some businesses require, maybe in a travel business, they require some sort of report about the liquidity of the business, so that holiday makers aren't going to be stranded somewhere when the holiday company fails, but that will be agreed in advance with an engagement letter. Other matters, uh, we would say, we would explain to management uh, the nature or the objectives of the audit is to give a true and fair view. We would explain to, or, or, to, or to see whether we can give a, the financial statements give a true and fair view. We would explain to, to managers that the audit will be carried out on a test basis. We're not going to look at everything. We're not going to give absolute assurance. We're only going to give reasonable assurance. We're not going to detect every potential fraud which is there. Uh, we will be looking at stuff really on a sample basis. And quite often that sample basis is a relatively small proportion of the transactions. Uh, it will say to directors, we expect unrestricted access to all records. We also expect complete answers to all our questions and all explanations must be given uh, when we ask them. Confidentiality of reports are quite interesting. Again, we're, we've kind of hinted at that because the audit report at the top said to the members. And I emphasise that this audit report was not for the bank and not from suppliers, it was to the members. And what we're doing in the letter of engagement, the engagement letter, is to say to the directors, this audit report is for the members. You are not to be kind of showing this to potential investors or showing it to the bank or suppliers and so on. If you want us to prepare something for the bank, we, we will do that, but it's not at the function of the order to do that, and you don't have our permission to send this with a loan application uh, to support that application. It, as I said, it, I mean, it's slightly, slightly peculiar because the financial statements and the order report are public documents, and of course the bank will ask for a set of financial statements, and they will see the audit report in there. Uh, but as I said before, the audit report is, is we try to keep it a private matter uh, between the auditors and the members. Other people, you can't stop them looking at it, but it's kind of at their own risk. You'll say about the applicable reporting framework, IESs, IFRSs, and so on. It'll say something about the planning. This will be negotiated with the, the client. When will come on our various visits? We need to know when the client needs the order to be finished by. Sometimes if the client is a subsidiary of another company, uh, then you have to make sure all the timetables work so that the group accounts can be prepared on time. It'll be thinking perhaps how many people we need for the various visits to the client. We will be thinking how many factories has a client, how many offices has a client, how many of these do we need to visit and, and the like. Fees I think I've mentioned. And the final thing that we set out in many engagement letters is the role to be played by internal audit. Internal audit are employees of the company uh, and one of their main tasks is to look at a system of internal control, assess whether it's working, uh, to test documents to make sure the internal control regulations are being followed. Uh, and relying on internal audit can be a great help to external auditors. It's quite common uh, if you had, let's say, a chain of shops with 10 branches, uh, maybe for the external auditors to visit four of those and look at the stock takes at four of them, examine the, the bankings from the till in four of them, and for the other six to be examined by internal audit. And then next year you move around, you, you, you will visit a different four and uh, so on. It uh, keeps down the cost to the client, really. Uh, we, we will be talking later about the sort of things we need to consider when relying on internal audit, but they are, can be very useful at performing routine parts of the audit. We will investigate and review what they've done to make sure the work has been done properly. 
but uh, they, these people are in a way experts in the company and they can carry out some of these tests very efficiently indeed.